As a social scientist, I often get asked the question, why do you study robots? Aren't you supposed to care about people? And the answer is pretty simple. People just do the darndest things when they meet robots. We like to believe that we're very rational beings, right? I understand that it's just a machine. I understand that if it's useful, then I will use it. But when you actually put a person in a room with a real robot, they do the craziest things. We become social, emotional, viscerally responded beings that just can't help but breathe a little bit of life and project a little bit of life into these things that we know are inanimate objects. Just last month, actually, I overheard one of our warehouse workers at our company saying to one of our robots, hey, buddy, you need some help? <laughs> and it was so heartwarming. Uh, so that's why it's interesting. Uh, this is a robot that I worked on about 10 years ago, just down the street over here. It's called the Personal Robot 2, PR2. And it was very capable. It could roll around, it could grab things. It was designed to look just like Rosie and be just like Rosie and be helpful in your home. Turns out only robotics researchers liked it. Nobody wanted it in their homes, even if they could afford it. And, you know, it was good for getting research done, but nowadays I'm working on trying to make robots and put them in places where people actually need them to be and not just where pop culture tells us that they should be. Because I think pop culture tends to be a little overly optimistic and sometimes a little overly pessimistic about where these robots should go. They tell us that it's either going to be Rosie the robot for the Jetsons or it's going to be the Terminator who's going to murder us all. <laughs> I think our pop culture is suffering from a failure of the imagination right now. These robots don't need to look like us. It's just easier to put a dude in a robot dancing suit than it is to be a little more creative. Also, these robots don't need to replace us. We're living with the false dichotomy right now of either fully human work or fully automated work, when really it's a lot more nuanced than that. And for over 10 years now, we've been being told that self-driving cars are just around the corner, so you're not going to have to drive your car anymore, and the world's going to be safer and so much better. And while there's been progress made in that direction, there's actually humans in the loop for every single one of those self-driving cars. And those people are there to help those robots to get out of trouble, to get unstuck when they get stuck somewhere on the road. Uh, earlier this year in San Francisco, during the Chinese New Year celebrations, one of those robo-taxis got really, really stuck uh, and pissed off a lot of people who were excited to be there to celebrate the New Year, and they happened to have fireworks in their hands, so guess what they did? <laughs> they had a very emotional response. Uh, I think, well, that's a little sad. Things don't need to be this way. We can do better. And the more you understand about psychology, the more you understand that technology is only as good as people's desire to use it. <laughs> Uh, there's an important piece here that's missing in the middle, where we design robots that work for people instead of ones that just replace us. In the case of self-driving cars, we've actually seen that there's bits of robotics that have come out of that work that are really great for improving things like adaptive cruise control to help people drive longer distances safer, parking assistance systems that help me <laughs> to drive and park and feel less stressed about it. And so these bits of robotics, I think, can actually be used to make human performance better and to make our lives better too. That user experience can improve as well. So let's take an example that's a little more everyday than just cars. Uh, you've probably seen a push cart. You've probably used one in a grocery store before. And wheels are an amazing invention that allow us to push things a lot further and carry more stuff. There's still a few pain points, though, with these things. I think we could make a little bit better. So if you think back to maybe a family gathering you might have had or family reunion last, this last summer, uh, you may have been sent on the grocery shopping run where you've got someone else's shopping list to shop in a store you're not familiar with, right? And that can be tricky. Now you've got to find things in a store where you don't know where the items are. You need to dodge all those other people on those other push carts in that space. And when you actually go and finally get those groceries and load them up in your car, do you actually put that push cart back in its designated parking area? Uh, the real goal there, right, is to get in and out of the shop as quickly as you can without having to return later on because you bought all the wrong things. Let's take that up a notch and look at the lives of warehouse workers. These are folks who are shopping for more than one person at a time. They're probably shopping for dozens of people simultaneously. They're working in aisles that carry not only people with push carts, but now you've got forklifts and electric pallet jacks that you've got to dodge on that floor. You're working for eight to ten hour work shifts and maybe even the night shift. So it's not surprising that people don't stick around in those jobs very long. They're really hard. And our increasing demands for e-commerce goods, we love ordering on online stuff, is making life really hard for these warehouse operators who just can't people keep people around in these jobs for long enough to get that work done. So what are they doing? 
One solution is the dark warehouse. I call this the we don't need no stinking people approach. We're just going to turn the whole warehouse into a robot and it's all going to be fine and people don't need to be there at all. Except actually you need a few people still around to run the stupid thing because it's going to break and there's going to be items that they can't handle. And so those people who are remaining are literally cogs left over in the big machine. Another approach is to make more humane warehouses where we provide better working environments, better tools, and better opportunities for the people working in those spaces so that they don't quit <laughs> within just a few months of starting. I've met more than a few warehouse workers, some of them who've worked with their employers for over a decade, and they are proud of their work, they're creative in their problem solving, and they're resilient in the face of challenges. They made it through the COVID-19 pandemic and got us all of those test kits on time. So what's a good day look like at work for them? Just like a high performance uh, musician, uh, or athlete, it's all about getting into the state of flow and staying there. For them, that means shipping orders on time and working with each other in smooth coordination. That's a tough thing, that's a high bar for design. I think the question for us now is how do we design robotic systems that help them to keep in a state of flow? I take inspiration from one of my favorite computer scientists here who said that these technologies, computation, all of these things that are supposed to be empowering people should get out of the way. They should be invisible in use. They should fade into the background of our experience while they're supporting us. And his favorite example of this was the carpenter's trusty hammer. That hammer is an extension of that carpenter's body. It enables him to do things without having to think about it. He's not thinking about the look and feel of that hammer or how to operate it. He's just using it to put the nail in the board. When you ask warehouse workers about their favorite tools, the number one answer is always the ride on forklift. And these things are pretty amazing. They enable us to carry way more stuff, to lift it way higher, and to drive with it way faster <laughs> for long distances. Uh, they literally make people superhuman. And that's just like the carpenter's trusty hammer. So taking inspiration from these tools, how might we design robots to do that too? At Robust AI, we're working on one answer to that question. We call it Carter because it's a cart first and it's a robot second. I'm gonna show you some examples of how we're trying to make it ready at hand and to empower these people. And just so you know, none of these videos are sped up and none of them are teleoperated by a person. So what if using a robot was just as easy as using a tablet in your home? You could just use Carter's test screen to tell it where to go. And even when Carter is driving around all by itself, avoiding obstacles, uh, you can just grab its handlebar and tell it, no, actually, I want you to go over here instead. Right? So it's literally and figuratively ready at hand. And while it would make sense for these robots to drive around as efficiently as possible, it's also important that you don't zoom around so quickly with the people that you make them feel unsafe. That is a challenge that we're seeing right now with other systems in these kinds of warehouses. And so what if your robot could respect the personal space of people in your environment? On the left here, you're going to see Carter noticing the person in the aisle and moving more cautiously around them. On the right, you're going to see Carter kind of squeezing by that box a little bit more quickly. Right? And so in this way, it can help to make people feel safe and be safe in those warehouses. Also, Carter, because it is a robot, it can speak to the warehouse management system. And so instead of having to use that checklist and figure out where to go next, Carter acts like a hunting dog telling you where it should go or where you might want to look for your next item on your list. And what if these systems could keep us out of harm's way? Uh, you're, in a moment, you're going to see Carter being pushed down an aisle into a blind intersection. And when it sees that there's oncoming traffic, it's going to resist being pushed into that traffic. <laughs> the nice thing about this is Carter can now help people to keep out of harm's way and keep itself out of harm's way. It's a guardian behavior to help people out to perform better at their jobs. Of course, you could imagine a future in which humanoid robots have all these same features. But I think one question to ask ourselves is, how far away is that future? And how much is it going to cost? These warehouse operators are having this problem now. They can't find enough workers to fulfill our orders, especially for the upcoming holiday season now. So they need solutions that are actually going to work with the people that they've got. I think. It shouldn't be surprising that when we design robots that become the stars of the show, that steal the spotlight away from us, people respond negatively. I think we have an opportunity instead to design robots that behave better when they're on people if we're going to accept them in our environments. When they don't behave well, we figure out ways to deal with them. Sidewalk delivery robots, for example, when they zoom around and get in the way, uh, get shoved aside, knocked over, and sometimes worse. Hospital delivery robots that get in the way in hospitals get 
accidentally turned off by the hospital staff. And if you're lucky, they'll call tech support and say, we don't know what happened, it just stopped working. <laughs> and self-balancing robots that get in the way are gonna get their balance tested, right? So I think uh, we can do better than this. We can design robots that fit better into human working environments and support people uh, more directly. So we have an opportunity now to advance a future in which people are the stars of the show and robots are just part of the supporting cast of characters. And I think that those robots don't necessarily have to look like people. I think the companies that are gonna be successful in the next 25 years are not gonna be the ones that are inventing science fiction futures, though that's fun. Uh, I think the most successful companies are gonna be those that design robots that support people, that make sense to people, and can be deployed in an affordable and scalable way. The key to that success is gonna be designing and deploying robots that speak to our human psychology. From a rational perspective, there needs to be a return on investment. Is the time and the money that I'm putting into this gonna be worth the benefit that, get, that I get out of this from my team? But also, from a social and emotional perspective, do I trust this thing? Do I feel like it's part of, on my side? Do I feel like it's respecting the people in my workspace? And so, I think for me as a social scientist, it's fun to work in this space because we need these insights in order to figure out how to help to these robots to be successful when they come into contact with the real human world. Thanks. <laughs>